Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Blackburn. On, on behalf of the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association, I want to welcome you to uh, Mechanics Hall to have this uh, talk with uh, Skyler Kelly and Sarah and James. Uh, we, uh, first of all, I would like to thank our sponsor, who is the Warren Memorial Foundation. Uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Skyler Kelly from Black Point Mercantile, who will tell us all about uh, uh, fabric uh, manufacture and the wonderful things they do. Hey, everyone. Uh, so let's see. First thing first, the company is named Black Point Mercantile after Black Point Road in Scarborough, uh, where our other founder and partner was living and working at the time he created the brand in 2011. And coincidentally, it also happens to be where my great-grandfather painted uh, every summer with Winslow Homer when he was a young man. Uh, he studied with Homer for years and years and was actually Homer's only student in the state of Maine. Homer, when he lived here, uh, refused to take on students at that particular studio, uh, except for my great-grandfather. So when the opportunity came along and Jeremy asked Sarah and I to join on board with him, it kind of seemed like kismet, and that's ultimately why we're here today. So Sarah's a trained painter, studied at the School Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and in the Netherlands and in Bruges, I think, is that right? I'll let you talk about it in a minute. <laughs> um, and uh, James is a leather worker and sound engineer. I'm a photographer and filmmaker and, you know, generalist. Uh, and I think that's kind of what it often looks like in entrepreneurial ventures at this point in time. Uh, Sam actually forwarded me an article a while ago, uh, talked about the death of the artist and the birth of the creative entrepreneur. So the three of us all identify as artists but find ourselves working as creative entrepreneurs. And I think it's quite true that we have to find uh, new ways to put ourselves out there. Um, and that the primary avenue now is business, not necessarily art, and even then art is a business. So it's interesting to the three of us and also to our customers that we choose to paint on the floor and sell our paintings as rugs. Um, the floor cloth has a really long and interesting history. Uh, People started making them in the United States probably 400 years ago as um, a way to make it easier to clean kitchen floors. Uh, it was a convenient material that was laying around and if you had some milk paint or oil paint you could color it however you wanted, create whatever designs you wanted. And over time that sort of got pulled up the economic class system into the middle class and the upper class and the merchant class. So you found floor cloths in many, many different environments, um, all the way from the low to the high. There's actually a, a famous house in Provincetown, Massachusetts, that is covered from floor to ceiling in many of its rooms entirely with painted canvas. So it has floor cloths, wall cloths, and ceiling cloths. Uh, in the mid-19th century, the floor cloth was basically obsoleted by linoleum. Uh, it was a much more efficient mechanical manufacturing process and it could be um, basically just rolled out and sliced off, printed very quickly. Um, I've been to some of the factories where they used to make linoleum way back in the day. And the floor cloth was laborious. Um, they were not as durable as linoleum, not as heavy, and way more expensive. There were a number of factories in the state of Maine, including in Hollowell. Uh, that went out of business about five years after linoleum came along. Since then, it's been a cottage industry, and um, it's really, I think, kind of strange that we're now <laughs> working on them again and selling them to some of the world's top architecture and design firms. Um, there's a company in San Francisco called Studio O Plus A that has hired us to make pieces for Nike, Uber, Cisco Electronics, uh, we have pieces in many of their offices. Um, I think we have half a, no, a dozen pieces in Nike's headquarters in Beaverton, which is just really kind of weird to us. And we have got clients in um, Tokyo, Manhattan, Brooklyn, San Francisco, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, all over the place. Uh, and we haven't done a lick of advertising. It's all happened by word of mouth. 
Um, we post a little bit to Instagram here and there, post a little bit to Facebook here and there. But primarily, it just the business comes to us um, kind of through osmosis. <laughs> and I'll pass it off to Sarah so that she can talk a little bit about um, what she's interested in. And then James, maybe we'll talk about the techniques that we use. Um, so here you go. I think one thing that is most interesting about our business model is that we are re reinvigorating the floor cloth. I know a lot of people always have stories about, you know, in my grandmother's house or in a historic home, I've seen a floor cloth. Um, and one of my favorite floor cloths I've, I've ever seen was in Wiscasset, Maine, at the Marston House. I don't know if anyone has been there, but she has a floor cloth from the early 19th century that you would never know that it's not plastic because it has been worn so it's just been with um walking on it and probably the elements the way that the paint and the canvas has been compressed it's it just seems impermeable and it looks like it was um linoleum taken out of an old home and to me that when i saw that piece it was testament to the viability of the product and so now that we are taking this older craft and imbuing it with contemporary styles, motifs, colors, and selling it to mostly modern interior decorators, I think that's really fascinating because it's, it's paying homage to, um, to an antique and to an old, old world way of creating something. Um, so I think that's been my favorite part of it. I, um, I like Skylar was saying, I studied painting. I studied old, um, old master Dutch style painting. And when I moved to Portland, I worked for the Historical Society here. I have a, a love for historical artifacts and objects and working in the archives at the um, the Historical Society was one of my favorite things. And so the fact that I can practice my art and make a living out of it in a beautiful town that is just saturated with its history is important to me and that I can reinvigorate an, a product like this um, just ties in all of my passions into one. Um, yeah, so uh, I hooked up with Skylar and Sarah about uh, about a half a year ago in November, um, and since then have been working, painting and designing, and um, it's been great. I um, My visual background is pretty varied. I've done some graphic design, and a lot of the majority of my painting, I guess, was been around painting on walls um, in the city, but... Um, uh, you know, it's it's great to work with such a durable medium and such a kind of storied um, tradition, really, um, and kind of bring some new life to it. And um, yeah, I didn't uh, really have a whole lot prepared to say here. I kind of just jumped in, but um, great to talk to you all. Uh, how do you do it? Um, well. Uh, so we start off with just a, a raw roll of canvas, and um, we actually use painting, uh, sorry, like concrete trowels to spread the base layers, uh, which will shrink it a little bit. And so it gets one layer on the bottom and then a couple on the top, and then we'll go from there with drawing the designs on. And it's all, so uh, the, the most fun thing and probably the most, the thing that kind of makes it really a piece of art is that they're, all of our lines are hand painted and so there's really no stenciling and there's no um, taping or anything like that. So really it's, it's very, it's a very detailed process which makes it really kind of a one of a kind in every one which is, which is kind of a lot of the appeal I feel like. Um, 
so yeah it's it's great to kind of feel like you're you know you're doing kind of uh almost a manufacturing job but there's so much more artistic license and kind of energy put into it um which is very kind of important to me you know loving the arts in general so it's a good mix of kind of both production and manufacturing and art and creativity and so and entrepreneurial you know endeavor so it's it's been really great and Maine is a good place I'm from Maine originally lived here growing up and then moved away for years and said I would never live in Maine again and have come back to Portland about a year and a half ago and it's a great place there's so much more going on here now and so it's really a good place for us to be yeah it is it really is we've um, we've learned throughout the course of this that uh, really the most important part of doing business is your relationships your relationships with your customers with your team with the kind of broader network of supporters who you don't always recognize as supporters. Like we found out that our landlord was a huge supporter of ours. And so he sort of became part of our team. And we've learned to, to look out and to find advisors to get our customers to be our best teachers. Um, that's been a critical part of the process is just continually asking our customers, like, how can we do this better? You know, can, you know we understand that our pricing is difficult to interpret how can we make it smoother how can we make it easier for you guys to get what you want um, and to really bring them into the process has been i think one of the best things that we've figured out that they're they're our best teacher um, the it's really interesting as james pointed out to make a product by hand today uh, it's very uncommon so we've had to find people who share our values, customers who understand what it means that someone has found a way to put the time that we do into one of these products and still sell it for a price that's a good value to them, uh, that they can, if they're a wholesaler, resell it for a, val a good value to the end customer. Um, finding that balance has been really, really interesting and has caused us to look differently at the world and, and understand its system of values. Um, yeah, without, without connecting with folks, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't really matter. Um, so the, the economic side of it, the money side of it is almost secondary. Like if, if we can build the right relationships and establish that we share values and then just keep making interesting work, then we'll survive. <laughs> and at some point, you know, we're right now we've we've kind of gotten to the point where we're starting to get orders big enough that it really stretches us that we, you know, we've we've got orders that are big enough and lead times that are short enough that we have to start thinking about all right, well, how are we going to scale up? Um are we going to scale up? What's it look like when we put together our our version of an assembly line? These are really really interesting questions. Um and they're going to take us into some very cool territory, I think, as we move forward over the next couple of years. Um, right now, it's, it's still a real challenge to balance our cash flow. That's, like, that's insane, just trying to figure out how to, how to offer the right terms to a customer, how to deliver on time, how to get like, all of your materials ready just so you can run payroll. <laughs> it's, sort of like, it's insane. It's been really, really, really difficult. And... There are times, I mean, there have been months when I've just woken up afraid every day. But you, and I, looking back on it, why I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change any of that experience. You know, you kind of feel as you're going into something like this, like, I got this, I can do this. But in my own, speaking for myself, what I've realized is that, that I'm not my heroes. You know, I can, I can understand how other people have have achieved great things in business or in art or what have you and and try to emulate them but what's what's starting to work is asking my own questions about my own environment um not basing my decisions based on or on uh, what i think what i think others would have done um that's been that's been a wake-up call recently uh 
So I think we've, we've covered a lot of it. There, there's some things that we do technically that, that have really never been done as far as I have seen in floor cloths. Um, <laughs> it's as funny as that is. It's like, um, you know, uh, talk about your innovations where you can. But we've, we've done a lot of these uh, patchwork pieces in order to overcome limitations in size of canvas and um, to overcome shipping costs. For example, it, you can't really ship something that's over 96 inches unless you go to freight. So it's a major constraint on a business like ours that really subsides by selling one piece at a time. So how do you make something and sell it if the customer wants it to be 14 by 16 feet? It's a really tough challenge because you don't want them to have to pay $400 to ship it from Maine to Seattle. So what we figured out was that we could, rather than using an overlap seam, which is a super simple seam, it takes no time at all, we would French seam them. And that meant that we could fold it in half and roll it up the other way. Um, once maybe I can get everybody up here, I can show you exactly what I mean. But what we found is that like, we can't actually fold the pieces because it'll arrive creased. So if we've got this specific type of seam in the center, then we can fold it in half and roll it up along the scene. It's like, you know, it's, it's not an earth-shattering innovation. You know, we didn't just invent, like, you know, a three-dimensional CPU or something like that. But it allows us to ship things at a much cheaper cost. <laughs> and for us, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so it's, it's funny, you know, you sort of have to recalibrate your expectations <laughs> about what you're going to achieve. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, I'm kind of I'm I'm running out of things to say. I think that we've we've covered. Um, hey, what's up, Nick? We've covered a lot of who we are and and what it is that we've done. Um, I think there may be a couple other things. Uh, one of one of the thinkers who's really inspired me is a, a Japanese art critic who founded the Japanese arts and crafts movement. His name was Setsu Yanagi, and Setsu Yanagi was. Um, really inspired by William Morris. He took a lot of William Morris's ideas about arts and crafts um, as they were being done in England or the movement in England, which was a response to mass-produced goods of the Industrial Revolution. So he took Morris's ideas and he sort of mapped them onto the Japanese cultural landscape. And that resulted in uh, um, Japan's very distinct approach to mass-produced handmade goods. And he, he talked about, kind of earlier in the century, in the 1930s, 1940s, about finding a way to get the machine and the human hand to work together um, to produce goods that, that really had soul, um, but could be accessible to a wider market that weren't you know, luxury items and that weren't um, so far out of reach that they didn't actually serve a, a real function in a person's home. So that's been a guiding light for me as we, as we navigate, you know, how much do we charge for this? Well, it's a painting, but you know, we also want people to be able to afford it and to live with it and for it to acquire patina and to, to grow with the maybe family that, uh, that grows around it. So, from here on out, I'll ask. I'll take some questions. Yeah. What What is the time frame for making one of these? It can vary significantly. Um, something like this, and this was really this was one of the very first pieces I made. Um, maybe thirty or forty days after I first I touched a sewing machine for the first time in my life. Um, so this one took me, I think, three solid days of work. Um, so call it 24 hours of time went into this piece. And then some things that we've done, we did this one piece for Uber, which was a nine by 12, and it was covered in intricate dots and dashes. If you had driven a car back and forth over it, like a hundred times. Like a toy miniature car. Like a miniature, <laughs> yeah, a miniature car. It looked, yeah. like, it looked like a combination of tire treads and roadway signals 
Morse code. It was very intricate. So what we did for that one was rig up a projector on the ceiling and shoot the whole pattern down onto the piece, um, actually in sections. And then we, we painted a section, then we moved the whole piece, painted another section, and just repeated the pattern until we'd done it. I think we had to move it six or eight times. And that took us, I think, it took two of us, sometimes three of us, three solid days of painting from like 9 a.m. until 7 p.m. I think, I think that's a really good example of how when you think about the, the original floor cloths and these repeating patterns that they would paint on the canvas, I mean, they were, they were doing this by mapping it out and with the geometry. And so now we have all of these contemporary tools and techniques. And so it just, when, when your tools are upgraded, your motifs and your products are, they evolve much differently. So um, when you see this piece, it's very geometric and it went into this really pristine, modern space with hard lines and concrete floors. And, um, and so I just, I think that this is, this is, again, is another really good example of that juxtaposition between what this old product was and how we are reinventing it. And another way to answer your question when it comes to how long does it take to create these, um, I'm actually not sure with the original floor cloth what they were using to coat it and protect them. Um, maybe it was some sort of like a resin base something and stand oil or a way to put a veneer on it. But um, with us, we're using wax and so we'll sand, we'll um, use like an orbital sander and we'll sort of impregnate the surface of the canvas with wax, or we'll use a, um, a non-toxic polyurethane. Um, it's, it's a whey-based poly that's actually made from whey byproduct from like a cheese factory in Vermont. And so um, depending on what kind of surface or coating that we put on it, that'll also change how much time it takes to produce these pieces. So we've gotten, um, right now in the in the wholesale order that we're putting together, James and I have been at it for, I don't know, when did we start really working on it? Like a week ago? Yeah, something like that. So this was our, this, it was a really good opportunity for us to, to time, to nail down every step. Um, and so by the, by the time we produce these 40 pieces that are all identical, which is kind of rare, we usually only get, um, well, there, sorry, there are two styles, so 20 identical pieces of each style. We, we usually only produce like one piece of one style in a wholesale order. So we never really set up ourselves to do a whole bunch of one type of piece in a row. And now we're starting to realize, we're starting to understand a little bit of, more about what, what parts of the process can be streamlined, where we can save a little bit of time, where we can put in more time on one particular part. And that's, uh, that's been really pretty cool. Uh, by the time we ship this thing out on Monday, we'll have learned so much about our product and we're really excited about that. Um, uh, Sarah touched on the, the wax and the orbital sander. Like that was something that I figured out a, a while ago. That's like, again, the innovation aspect of this has been really fun. I never would have anticipated it. But I've gotten to experiment with all sorts of materials we all have, and we've all figured out our own different ways of, of dealing with how the canvas shrinks or how we find the center and square all the edges. I mean, there are aspects of, like, that draw on our, our backgrounds in carpentry, in, in painting, in design, in uh, just all sorts of different problem solving. Um, but the, the, the wax is one of the coolest things, you know, figuring out that I could use a really, really fine grit sign, sandpaper and uh, kind of grind, grind it in over the whole surface and then use um, a different kind of wax. So like beeswax is really soft and then you, carnauba wax is really hard. So you can basically, you can, you can try to anticipate uh, how the piece is going to age over time and you can use these different waxes or finishes to 
to paint in the future, essentially. Uh, one of the most interesting examples of this was uh, in a hotel in Hudson, New York, a boutique hotel founded by this guy who's really, really well known in the food and beverage industry in, the, in New York City. He contacted us about producing two runners that were three feet wide and 46 feet long and one that was three feet wide and uh, 39 feet long. First of all, like seriously, 46 foot long runner, that, I mean, that's, you, you really don't get that outside of a factory. Um, the only people who produce runners at that scale are big factories. So that our tiny little workshop, I mean, I say tiny, we've got 1400 square feet compared to most factories, we're tiny. Um, but we had, you know, 70 foot long workshop, which happens to be an old movie theater. And we could roll out canvas, paint it, and we used beeswax in that instance. And we used beeswax and then we buffed it by hand. I hadn't really figured out the, the sander at that point. They looked great. We sent them off. Um, a month later, I got a, an email saying, hey, uh, how do I clean these? I say, oh, well, uh, this is how we clean them. And then a week later, I get, ah, this isn't going to work. We haven't even opened yet. And he sends me a picture, and they're just like, it didn't look good. It looked really bad. So I, I came up with a solution to the problem. I, I went outside, and I painted over another piece that I had beeswaxed. And in that process, discovered another finish. And so after that, we started doing a layer of paint, then a layer of beeswax, then another layer of paint. And it allowed us to create this really, really cool texture. So in a solution to a problem, we came up with an improvement to our product. Ultimately, I checked in with him another two months later because I heard, hadn't heard back from him. And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. It's cool. They've broken in. And then another couple months later, we, didn't, we haven't heard anything from him, and we encountered a photographer by chance who had gone to photograph the hotel and specifically mentioned that the floor cloths were incredible and that they looked like leather. And that's something I never anticipated. I really didn't know that they would age so significantly, that they would become so smooth um, and so darkened by the wear that they would end up looking like leather. So I still haven't seen them in person. But that's one of the, that's another thing that's really neat, I think, about what we're doing is that we, we don't know exactly how it's going to change. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we were seriously, yeah, we, we cross our fingers a lot. <laughs> so about, um, we use the orbital, orbital sander a lot, and I'm kind of laughing in my head because I'm thinking about, again, the original floor cloth you would make it and it would be pristine and you would want it to last as long as possible and make sure you know hope that the kids and the dogs and everyone isn't running all over it all the time um, but with us we take us after we paint them we take a sander to the to our finished painting and i'm thinking about coming home with a pair of jeans and my dad being like why did you spend money on jeans that already have a hole in them you know like this is silly and so something that is in in vogue and in demand is um having products around you that already have a patina or a story or age to them so when we take the sander to the painting, what we're doing is we're kind of bringing up a relief. It's sort of like a grave rubbing of the floor that we're working on. And um, with the runners in particular, this was, that I think that was my, that's the product that I think was the most special because we sanded them on the thin boards that it's not like a beautiful floor like this, it's very, jaggy and so when we did the relief process on these runners the boards came through the runners so there's a little piece of Portland history in some boutique hotel in New York because as you walk down the hallways you're walking on these ghostly artifacts of the wood floor in the old movie theater on Exchange Street and, and some of our other pieces too um, when the 
I don't know if you guys went to the old movies on exchange, but when they ripped out the theater seats, they left these divots in the um, in the, the wood, I don't the composite wood floor. And so when we distress, we call it distressing, when we distress our floor cloths, you get these little divots in the design. And that, again, is a piece of history of Portland architecture that comes through. And I think that's, it's, it's a really special thing yeah. about our products. Yeah. And also, when, when we wax them on top of that same floor, the wax goes down more heavily on the parts of the floor where, um, that were protruding. So not only did more paint get taken off, but more wax got put on. And so what happens is when it leaves the, our studio, those areas are brighter. But what we know is that over time, those areas are going to get darker. So we've, we've just now really started to be able to predict what's going to happen to the pieces in the future and what kind of life they're going to have. And that, I think, is one of the, that's really exciting for all of us. What, uh, if you were doing, looking back when you started, are there things that, uh, any, uh, challenges that you've overcome that you could help us or sh share with us? Yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, there hasn't been any challenges. Yeah, we, I mean, it's been super easy. <laughs> we're incredibly well managed. Our back office is so tight you wouldn't believe. Uh, you no, know, actually, it's, it's been insane. Uh, I think that one of my earliest missteps um, in guiding the company was placing too much emphasis on tools. Um, not tools that we use to produce these things, but tools that are sold to young companies as being a panacea for your management problems or your cash flow problems or what have you. Uh, recently, I read an article by the head of the MIT Media Lab, Joey Ito, about accounting and the the incredible fact that our system of accounting is 700 years old. And it had been on my mind since we began to question why I was having so much difficulty doing something that had been 700 years in the making. Because I thought about the history of commercial activity in the Western world and that it's been done basically up until yesterday with a ledger and a writing desk. You, you don't need fancy tools. You really don't. I mean, the, the most important thing is your relationships. And that's sort of, you know, that's been something that's, that's come to me too late. So I wish that I had known, or I had really thought about it right up front, that I don't need a lot of tools. I just need to be able to communicate effectively and to, um, to know what orders I've got to produce, to know what stuff is on hand, and to um, know how much money I've got in the bank and to not pursue um, products that take my attention away from the physical world right around me because my product is physical and I actually have to ship it and into some virtual space that's supposed to improve my ability to communicate or make it faster to keep my books or what have you when I really could have been done in doing it all for zero cost basically in a simple ledger or in an Excel worksheet. You might want to explain what some of these tools Oh, are. yeah. So, like, I mean, I had this fantasy at the very beginning that, like, that I was going to um, basically run the company like a, a technology startup um, and that we were going to take some of the tools and tactics used by, um, you know, these cutting-edge companies in Silicon Valley. So we started to use um, tools like Slack, um, for example, and a lot of other things that... They were basically, the intention of which was to automate a big part of the business. Um, but the, the, so yeah, they were all basically automation tools. Um, they're web-based they're web yeah, web tools or apps or, I mean, just like, I mean, we live in a world where the app is the solution. I mean, that's kind of, that's how we're, how we're marketed to as a people now, that like if you've got a problem, there's an app that will solve the problem. Um, it, like w <laughs> one of one of the things for me that's been that's been a, a pain to work through is that um, you know the 
the to-do list application doesn't actually to do doesn't actually do my list, <laughs> you know. So it's like it's really no more helpful than just having a whiteboard in the office a lot of the time. Um, so it's it's applications that are marketed to you as being something that will solve a specific problem or automate a specific process or what have you, but. Um, as a startup, you really don't know a lot of what those problems are, especially if you're trying to develop a new product or resegment a market, which is what we've we've done. I mean, we we're sort of in the rug sector of the market, but we're really trying to drive a wedge into that because nobody else is doing this um, in the in the sort of um, aesthetic community where we're operating. It's it really is a a product in what they call white space. So we just don't we don't know um, what tools we're going to need. What's most effective? You know, are are people going to buy them from our online store? So a lot of what we did right up front was think, all right, we're going to go for e-commerce, and I'm going to set everything up so that it'll be basically automated. When somebody buys something from the website, it'll generate a work order that'll be like on a screen or it'll pop up on our phone and it'll say like, do this now. <laughs> and it totally did not work that way. Like nobody ever bought anything online. <laughs> I had, I had one, I've had one customer in 16 months buy a product from my website. That's like, that's not how the world is supposed to be working right now. What people buy our products when they walk into some place that has one and find out who made it and send us an email. So our sales cycle is totally offbeat from how everybody else seems to be doing business. Um, so there's that, and then uh, undercapitalization is just, man, that's really hard to deal with. Like um, when when this opportunity came up, I'd been working just as a freelance photographer and filmmaker, and you know, just go, going from from job to job and thought like, all right, this seems like a sure thing. We've got some accounts already. Like, all right, I can just dive into this and, and if I work hard and if we sell things in order to get accounts, then, then I'll get out of debt eventually. This will actually work out. And I ran some numbers, but right off the bat, my numbers were, were way too optimistic. You know, you generate pro forma and you think like, all right, so I'm gonna be able to capture retail sales, I'm gonna be able to capture online sales. And I just had no idea that I wasn't gonna have online sales, That that we were going to run into problems getting our retail location opened and it was just not going to happen. Like, there were all these things, just so many assumptions that I made um, without running low cost experiments to find out if they were actually going to pay off. So, so basically, you know, we didn't, we never got a loan or anything like that. We just basically um, didn't pay ourselves. <laughs> Still don't pay ourselves. And uh, that's, that's created in incredible stress. Um, that part I would take back for sure. I would, I would do that differently if I could. So I, I also take back what I said earlier about not changing anything. <laughs> that's the big one. Uh, if I had, you know, we, we tried to, we pursued an investor um, and they wanted to own the majority of the company right off the bat. And that wasn't something that we were willing to sacrifice. Um, that was one thing that I think we were really smart about. We were really smart about that one because, uh, yeah, they wanted to own like 60% of the company. And they were really excited about uh, a product that we weren't interested in making anymore. So they would totally do wish, would have redirected the company, turned us into employees, and had us uh, making handbags out of recycled coffee bags which is really what they wanted us to do. Um, so we, we, maintained, we, we stayed true to our values, but we didn't find uh, the right way early, or not, early enough to support our values. And that was, the, the solution to that would have been finding new relationships. Um, and the, the way to do that, I understand now, is to actually ask your customers how to sell to them to, to reach out to people and say, hey, uh, so-and-so recommended that I give you a call because I've got this weird idea and a few people have bought into it. Um, it solves this problem. Is that a problem you've got? Oh, that is a problem you've got. Uh, how much would it be worth to you if I could solve the problem this way? 
oh, it's worth that much to you. Well, could I get this much? And this, this is the kind of conversation that goes on now that I'm having with my customers now. And they're, they're helping me to solve the problem that I put so much of my time and energy into trying to solve very early on, which was how much do I charge for these things? And I invented so many ludicrously complex solutions for this, like seriously. I was inventing algorithms in order to like calculate the number of linear inches that I was painting and sewing. At one point I thought, all right, here's what I want to do. I want to paint, um, I want to visualize uh, as I'm painting down the line, I've got the paintbrush going down the line that I've drawn, and I'm seeing 75 cents rack up every time I go an inch. <laughs> so it's, it, it's literally going ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. So how do I calculate how many linear inches there are in a piece so that then I can tell my customer, oh, well, there are this many linear inches of paint in this piece and this many linear inches of hem, so the cost of the rug is going to be $17,000. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> like, can't you understand that, people? No, <laughs> it was the dumbest thing that I spent like a month, I, I spent so long working on this problem when I really could have just asked my customer, like, hey, how much is this worth to you? <laughs> So those are a couple, <laughs> a couple of the really numb things that I've done. Tom, you know a little bit about our business. Are there, and we made a lot of mistakes, so <laughs> maybe there's something in particular that you would want us to shed light on? Well, the only thing that I would uh, suggest, and I, we talked about this before, is just going out and getting working capital along. Yeah. And having a good business plan that allows you to demonstrate where things are going uh, and being realistic in your performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are, the, those are the critical elements to it. Yeah. To at least that, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the realism in performance was, uh, was that was uh, maybe our, our major, major failure. And we didn't get very good feedback on it. We went to see a number of people and we talked with a couple of potential investors. Like we, we, we talked with the loan officer from the bank. We talked with CEI. We talked with these investors, who, one of whom is like a, um, a Wall Street analyst who specializes in evaluating, in, uh, evaluating companies. And none of them gave us straight feedback actually on these things. Um, I think maybe we we're asking the wrong questions, but we also live in a culture where nobody really wants to offend each other and often speaking plainly and giving real, like, positive, I mean, um, like, uh, um, constructive criticism is something that a lot of people are afraid of because it leads to what feels vaguely like conflict and we're very, I don't know, it's, conflict is a very uncomfortable thing for a great many of us, myself included. Um, so, so it was tough because we'd put our numbers in front of people and say, this is what we're going to do. You know, we've, we've identified this space, we're going in this direction, and we th we're, we're going to capitalize on all these opportunities. And uh, we, we never got somebody to just look us in the eye and say, that's stupid. Like, pick one of those things. And, and in fact, don't even pick any of those things that you say are going to be revenue streams on your pro formas pick up the phone and find out like if you can get some more clients. It's great that you've got a little bit of revenue now, but seriously just start calling people. Um, that was, yeah, I wish that we'd, we'd somehow tease that feedback out of people. And I know now how to do it, how to solicit that feedback. It's just a, a tough lesson to learn the hard way. So yeah, working capital alone would have been huge. Um, we eventually found some, uh, Another thing, the banks were, um, they absolutely, totally refused to give us a loan. Um, if we had had three years of financials, then they might have been interested. But they really were not interested at all in uh, giving us even a small amount of working capital. So that's what it is. Um, but there, there are some tools out there. I mean, I spoke against some web-based tools, but people have reinvented invoice factoring in a way that really makes sense uh, for businesses like ours. Uh, so we found this one company called Fundbox and they approved us for a line of credit for 2500 bucks 
in five minutes and it allowed me to overcome all the gaps in our cash flow due to net 30 terms that customers often kind of like just expected us to take. That was another big thing. I should have negotiated cash on, cash on delivery for everything right up front. But I kind of came into the business with some clients who already had their expectations set at net 30 and then that sort of rolled on to some other people, uh, other accounts. Uh, so I would have, you don't pay for 30 days. So I would have, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I didn't know. And now I'm passing on the same thing. So, so people think that they've got four weeks to pay you because you're a, fir a firm that can just absorb that. And you can't. You, you can, as a startup, that's just that's like a great way to shoot yourself in the head. So, so we eventually found Funbox, um, and they make it super easy. Like I've got a twenty-five hundred dollar credit client credit line. I click a button, and they deposit money into my account against one of my invoices. So that that has bridged the gap in a lot of circumstances. It's allowed us to keep functioning. It's expensive. It's like it's a really expensive form of credit, but they also um, they allow you to pay it off really quickly. So if you take the full term in order to pay off that loan that they're giving you, it can cost you like a hundred bucks for three thousand. But if you pay it off early, so basically if you predict, if you say to a customer, "All right, this is net fourteen." I expect payment within 14 days, and you um, only have to pay two of the weekly payments before the check comes in, and you can just take care of the entire debt. Then you paid, you know, 16 bucks on a couple thousand in order to bridge that cap, that cash cash flow gap. So that's really helped us out. Um, we, uh, I mean, we're we're young people like in our early 30s who are dealing with student loans and having been freelancers and picked up credit card debt and stuff like that. So it's sort of, you know, you don't come into this perfect and then it, it gets increasingly difficult as you go along, as you make more sacrifices. Um, so I guess if I were doing it again, there are things that I would have taken care of first. You know, I think you really have to, you have to, to think very carefully about entrepreneurship and to think about the kind of family that you want to create because it is your it's an offspring it's it, and it it develops a culture kind of uh, with you but also independently of you it has it's weird i mean i don't the way i feel about my company is that it's kind of got a mind of its own <laughs> it's it kind of has a personality that i don't really control and that personality, I think, is the way it's perceived by our customers. So, so it, it seems to be this unique entity that, that comes partly from me, partly from Sarah, James, and partly from our other partner, Jeremy, but also from our customers. And so it is independent of all of us. Um, so I see the corporation as this really interesting metaphor. And... Uh, just like you would have to think really hard about the kind of life that you would want to give to a child, you have to do the same thing for a company. And if you want to give a great life to a child, then you really have to have your house in order. You have to have your affairs in order. You have to be able to be totally emotionally available and accessible to that person. And I think the same thing is true for a company. So I would have, I would have worked harder to put myself in a better position um, before I did this. Um, I guess, or maybe the next time I do this, the, the next company I, I found, which I, I kind of have, I guess, with, with Kino. Um, I'm now the president of a nonprofit, too. We are bringing a film based movie theater back to Portland. Um, so, where the movies on exchange used to be, which we've been producing product from for almost a year now, where we've built a projection booth and we just got a, a really great 16 millimeter projector on loan from the Museum of Art. And we've got 250 16 millimeter prints to draw from, uh, and we're going to start screening movies every month for the public, which is kind of a huge deal because there's nowhere in Southern Maine to see a film projected on actual photochemical film at this point, um, other than occasionally at the at the museum. But that's what we'll be dedicated to doing, and this venture is going much more smoothly <laughs> than the first one. Um, I think James has really been thinking a lot about entrepreneurship lately, 
um, because this is the second startup that he's worked with in the last year, really. So I wonder if you've got anything that you wanted to say about how, having been part of two of these teams, what you've learned and, and how you would do things differently. Hmm. I mean, I think with, uh, well, with us three, we're kind of all, we're all from the artistic kind of background. So uh, we all like to think big and kind of dream big. And I think um, for me, what I learned well, what I've learned just in working over my lifetime is just that a lot of times it's really about kind of doing the small things and doing all the small things right and um, kind of getting past thinking about the big picture and really focusing on the small picture because it's just, I mean, if, if you don't do the small things right, you're not going to get to the big part ever. Um, or at least not very easily. Um, and I think that for us, for the three of us, we all kind of have that artistic dream and kind of fire which keeps us going, which is great, and it's great for an artistic company, but um, really kind of reining it in and focusing on, you know, if we want to do this, we need this little tool, and we've got to make sure this thing works right, and, you know, we're, we're advertising this, but does it, are we able to produce it in this amount of time that we're talking about, and, you know, um, it's easy to have made some things and be like, okay, cool, we can do that. You want a hundred of them? Let's do it. But um, it really takes kind of really kind of letting go of the big grandiose kind of dreams and really kind of focusing on the the really small day-to-day -day important things. So I don't know. That's probably one of the most important lessons I've learned, I guess. <laughs> Not about entrepreneurship, but I've obviously my heart is in another era. My mind is in the past, <laughs> um, and I think about I when you were talking about the company gaining its own character and its own persona. I completely agree with that. I feel like without it's totally out of my control, and that it's been this huge snowball going down a mountain and I'm just running after it, trying to bat it in the right direction to make sure it doesn't fall off the mountain or hurt itself. And I think a lot of that has to do with running a business in today's society where cyberspace has such a huge influence because it can be our company, we can run it the way we want, the products we design, we make them by hand. But the moment that the internet is involved, all of a sudden people are writing about you and about your product and who who they think you are and then other people appropriate that information and then all of a sudden it's disseminated everywhere and it's and it's nothing that actually came from your mind or your heart um, and so you can really lose control over your brand's identity when it's out there and uh, when it's out there on the internet and that's something that's so different about running a modern day company as opposed to businesses that you guys have run or that you've worked for, um, it really changes things a lot. And these, and these web-based tools, I mean, you could, you could essentially be totally hands-off and have a successful company that is just selling products left and right and you're on the beach in Maui with a pina colada in your hand not doing a thing. It's really wild. And even though I've sort of grown up in this generation, I can appreciate and be awed by how the internet has affected small industries and big industries. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. It's probably a good time to open it up for questions. Or I heard someone talking about earlier that they had made a floor cloth themselves was this, um, did you make multiple or was this a hobby? No, I, I sold the wholesale. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I did them in the basement of my house. <laughs> With a paintbrush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. One at a time. Mm -hmm. One at a time. Yeah, we know about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think on, on what Sarah was saying, you know, kind of what, what you were
you're talking about. I mean, I think it's it's easy to think about how the internet you can be totally hands off and and it's possible. But I think bef I think and what we're learning right now is that it really takes before you get there. It does take a lot of hands on. You know what I mean? And like really you know we're we're not going to get to those places without lots and lots and lots of hands on and like <laughs> real like sitting down and working for hours and hours and hours and not getting up and not going anywhere and not doing anything so i mean you know i mean i guess what i've learned as far as being in a part of startups is that it it really does at the end of the day take a lot of just hard work <laughs> and if you're ready to do that, I think that's that's what it takes, <laughs> I guess.